Hello everyone, I'm Nadia Kabilinke, visual artist living between Berlin and Kiev. It's a tremendous pleasure for me today to stay here and exchange with you thoughts and ideas about borders, impossible possibilities, and possible impossibilities. In this sense, I would like to refer to my artistic practice and theory where I'm exploring ways how to get over these borders and make some impossibilities possible. To start with, I would like to briefly talk about a sculpture, a horizontal sculpture that is laid over the entire surface of a public square in Neukölln, a southern borough of Berlin. Being invited to propose a public artwork, I found myself confronted to a fundamental dilemma. Most public artworks impose an object to the pedestrians who would have to see and go around it on a daily basis. But how long would it take until going around something would have turned into avoiding it? And did I really want to occupy the space of the people of Neukölln with an object? And who were I to decide over their heads what kind of object that should be? I couldn't reply to these questions, so I decided to involve the citizens of the borough. The outcome was a demographic pavement representing each and every person living in this particular part of Berlin in 2011. The 400,000 stones were imported from six regions of the world, reflecting the immigration background of the population. This is how I skipped the vertical dimension of a 3D object in favor of a horizontally laid outwork that became indifferent from the place instead of occupying it. In the end, it was made not only for, but with the people of Neukölln. And the good thing is that we shared responsibility. Before and after this piece, I did other works that preferred horizontal over vertical lines. And I also involved very different participants and people coming from Italy, the United Kingdom, and the United States. You can see some of these works on the screen behind me. But what I kept in my mind is was a horizontal and asymmetrical relationship to things, beings, and most importantly, to people. By no means, especially not within the field of art that addresses our minds and feelings, can I put myself in a superior position in order to tell other people what to see and how to see it. In return, everything becomes possible due to the absence of hierarchies. Hierarchies take away possibilities, whereas heterarchies offer possibilities. I think this could be an essential difference between the nature of artistic practices and political discourses. Borders play an important role in both cases, but the outcome is different. Working with participants is a very creative process and inspiring. It's not easy. We share experiences and come, at least in most cases, to unexpected results. Objects and situations coming out of this process are loaded with contingency and have the character of an open question. The artistic space, let it be organized by human beings, objects, medias, or any kind of agents, is a symmetry where everything lies on the same level. And where even objects and materials can tell a story. It somehow relates to this space, to this philosophical or poetical space of poetry, where nothing is excluded from being possible. This space is neither grounded in discourses, nor in power structures, nor in common understandings. It's an open space where everything speaks to our physiology and our psychology, expanding and multiplying in our perception, affection, empathy, and desire. If we think of it, art is the only medium in our society where it's not mandatory to have an intelligible outcome. It doesn't have to make sense. It can be open, borderless, contradictory, and by this reason, full of possibilities. The political space, on the other hand, could never bear those contradictions and conditions. A statement aiming to convince or persuade others of something needs to repress manifold possible interpretations that would overkill the consent manufacture. Thus, it applies popular conventions, sorry, conventions, moral codes, red lines, no-go zones, 
and it contains uh, everything within a certain range of acceptance. Ambiguities and misunderstandings would cripple the political of, uh, sorry, political, uh, would cripple, <laughs> I'm sorry, the political effectiveness of any political discourse or political message. I'm surprised that my uh, sound is so loud, so I'm listening to myself speaking and this is really like freaking me out. <laughs> I'm sorry about this. <laughs> it's as if there's a distance between myself and myself. Anyways, I'm going back to my point. So this being sa said, the uh, fundamental difference between territory of art and the public discourse becomes obvious. I want to cite a French philosopher that I like very much, Gilles Deleuze. He said once that art had nothing to do with communication. It would carry no information, no understandable message, and no foreseen consent. But it had all to do with resistance. Resistance against the pressure of the art world, of the fashion and trends. In one word, it is resistance against time. Persistence in time, in time is still a rock-solid approval for any artwork. But how could it be timeless if it would adopt topics of the actual political agenda that may change from one day or, let's say, scandal to the other? Or let's turn the question around. Would the criteria of timelessness work for a political project? The reason for an artwork resistance against time is most likely its radicality. This radicality could even be radicality of beauty, or ugliness, or radicality of absurdity, which led to Dadaism, for example, or radicality of subtraction with minimalism, or just the incredible exhibition that I saw yesterday in the Paris Museum, radicality of rapping with Christo. Artwork needs to be radical enough to push the boundaries of sense-making over time-specific limitations. But would the quality of radicality work for a politi political idea that aims to gain a broad agreement? Now, speaking from someone who just came from Gen Germany, I would say, never again. However, I believe that R needs to provide radicality for our lives. It talks to the invisible and affective part of us, this very part of us that makes us to full human beings and that made mankind produce art ever since. We probably need this radicality of things that last. And art is most likely the he healthiest and socially acceptable way to propose radical position, at least compared to religion, science, economy, or even politics. In this role, art cannot follow any kind of emancipating or pedagogical intentions. Why? Because this would imply a control over the outcome of the artistic process what literally could mean that the final artwork was already done before it started. Or to put it in more radical words, it could be already dead before it died. Thank you.